my hands went up. And I think it finally hit that there are people who I was president of the Education Foundation. I'm a volunteer, I coach my kids in Glendale Little League. Like I'm an active dad, small business owner, and I'm getting pulled over for just working out. The world is not the same. Like we're, we're living by a different set of rules. And thank goodness, I mean, nothing happened, but had he been, you know, he could have pushed that to something even greater. We got to do some things differently. There has to be some, some, some difference. And I think the personal connections is what does it because if the cop knew me, it wouldn't have been a big deal, but because they don't know you, they pull you over forever. And now I'm a, now I'm a village trustee. Now the police all know me and now I'm sort of their boss. And so now they're like waving and say, Hey, Darren, how you doing, sir? <laughs> so I guess like the thing about that too is like, I, you know, we over lunch had this kind of session about talking about very similar things, but my whole thing is like, why do we keep re-traumatizing people of color to tell stories of oppression when it's just like bountifully evident, you know, and it's documented, like you could Google it and come up with trillions of searches in 0.2 seconds. So I get really frustrated that we continually have to be like, this happened to me. And then this happened to Corey Joe, And then this yeah. happened to Darren. And this happened to Sherry. Like, yeah. really, you need to hear it 20,000 times before you believe it's a real thing? Like, really? So that, I mean, that's the thing. And I mean, as, we're, we're, uh, as people are kind of coming in the room, hey, fuelers, you, you listen, the conversations, we're, we're, we're making connections. We can't even stop. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's how connected we are. We can't even stop. Um, but yeah, as, as people are coming in the room, welcome. Um, but yeah, Julie, to your point, I think, I've been having that same conversation about the cognitive dissonance and um, so many times that people deny these stories that like are constantly in their faces and people are constantly saying, no, it's a little bit different for me. And I think in this moment, people are really starting to, um, I mean, and not everybody, but I feel like it's a critical mass of folks that are um, open um, to the truth because I mean, once you, once you see it in the way that the world um, has seen it. Um, that shock has really opened people's um, eyes. So I, I'm excited for the discussion that we're going to have. So welcome to all the folks that are kind of uh, coming into this space, Fuel Milwaukee. My name is Corey Joe Biddle. I'm the executive director of Fuel. We have a great panel of folks that we're going to um, talk to with talk with today about our circles of influence and whether or not we can drive racial equity? Um, can we end racism through through friendship? What would that look like? So um, I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to kind of set this up because I think it'll kind of all come through in our conversation. I'm going to get right into the panel here. So um, this is a beautiful panel, a beautifully diverse panel, and I can't wait to have this conversation with these folks. Sherry Tran and I go way back, way, way back. Uh, she's the Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Freighter Health. Darren Fisher and I have known each other for a while too through Fuel. He's the founder and CEO at Spirity. Anthony Iraqi is a parks and rec, rec professional, a blogger, a podcaster, <laughs> an author. Oh my God, he's a speaker. He does so many different things. Uh, so Anthony, thanks for being here. We have Julie Gokal Gandhi. Hey, Julie. Hey, so Corey. glad to have you here with your pretty smile. Can't wait to talk to you. And another one that I go way, way back with, Tanya. Mazer Posner. Hey, Tanya. Hey. So glad you can join us and share your perspective. So I'm going to get us in gallery view here uh, so everybody can see. If you're in the space already, you know, we always like you to go in the chat and get comfortable. So come into the chat room and tell us, leave us a little comment. Let us know why you were excited about this conversation today and why you wanted to participate in it. And a lot of the panelists will be able to see your comments and respond to you directly. If you want to ask a question privately that you'd like for me to pose to the panel, just go into the Q&A section. But right now, show a little bit of uh, love in the, in the chat. Tell us, tell us why you want to be a part of this conversation. So I want to kick off the conversation with, I kind of told everybody your you know, name and title, but um, and typically I'll say, tell us a little bit about your work and how it relates to this topic. But in this case, I want to talk a little, want you to give us a quick little intro about your life and how it relates to um, this topic. For me as an African-American woman, um, I know what it is to have a diverse network professionally, but it's been, been made clear to me over the years, especially since I have kids, that I have to do a better job of really bringing people into my actual life in general. I mean, I think that's a Milwaukee thing, but all of us have to work a little bit harder to um, actually build true friendships that go beyond just the interactions of 
um, work. So that's why I kind of wanted to have this conversation. And I know everybody's experience will be a little bit different. Sherry, I'll start with you. Kind of talk to us about you and why this is important to you. Well, you know, my, my upbringing um, was one where, you know, I was always the only one that looked like me in an environment surrounded by mostly Caucasian white people. Um, so really finding um, that circle of diversity, it was not easy for me. I had to be very intentional about that. Um, but I think that's really what sparked the interest for me. Um, I was able to, at a very young age, start to trust my friends enough to share more about my culture with them because I was very embarrassed by it, trying to fit in um, as a kid in a white community. Um, but as soon as I started to open up and share more about my background, my culture, what my family did, um, friends were interested and they were actually kind of, you know, really curious and wanted to know more. And I felt energized by that and I wanted to share more. And then that sparked the interest to want to learn more about other people too. Um, so that sparked that, you know, cultural curiosity in me at an early age. And I just kind of pursued that um, throughout my, uh, my life and, you know, was grateful to find a career that pays you to do that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so it's really been, I guess a chicken or the egg thing for me, right? It's always been an interest for me, a passion for me, uh, diversity and learning about people and, and cultures. Um, and my career actually helps feed that, that passion for me as well. So it kind of is a continuous cycle of, of just being able to apply what I learn to my job and apply my job to my life um, and vice versa. So that's just kind of been how it's uh, perpetuated for me. Thank you. How about you, Dilly? Um, so I was actually born in Mumbai and my, I am an immigrant and my parents are immigrants. So we came to this country when I was three and I had the great privilege of, um, for most of my summers growing up, going back to India. So I developed this love for my culture in a way that was kind of insulated, right? Cause I now looking back, I'm like, oh, I did get made fun of a lot, like for being Indian and bringing Indian food to lunch. And, but I just always was like, well, okay, you know, and so um, Sherry, much like you, I, I mostly grew up in a white neighborhood. And so I felt like I found myself kind of like de facto cultural ambassador of explaining to people that like, no, the swastika was appropriated, you know, for a youth that wasn't intended um, by Hinduism and it, explaining turmeric before turmeric was cool and chai and all this <laughs> stuff. So um, I feel like I so enjoyed sharing that. And so I wanted to learn from others too, in a really authentic and genuine way. And so as I think about my networks, um, I thought it was always important to share and learn and grow from one another. But I think that can be really hard because, um, you know, a lot of communities do stick together because of the fear of being rejected. And I mean, we're seeing it in the world, right? Of when you don't feel comfortable and when you feel like you're constantly marginalized and targeted, it's hard to want to go out in the world and live authentically. And so um, I think I, I know how that feels and I see it in the world. And so I try really hard to, um, to break, to, I, we can always do better, right? But um, I try really hard to make uh, connections that I ne don't necessarily or won't, wouldn't make just kind of staying in my own lane. So, yeah. Thank you. How about you, Anthony? Yeah, definitely. And thanks for having me today. Yeah. So I grew up in a small town in Michigan, actually. And so there wasn't necessarily a lot of diversity in my community. But interestingly enough, we did have a very large um, Middle East population there as well. And so that was my original you know, exposure from a young age to individuals with a different, different culture than mine that came over and with their families and were working and going to school with those students and growing up and becoming friends with them. But outside of that, there wasn't really a large um, black population or Hispanic population or anything else. And so for me, leaving that environment and going into college, it was an opportunity to learn, make new friends and meet people from all over the state of Michigan. And eventually I graduated and moved down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a couple of years. And so you can imagine going from, you know, the Midwest and a small town to a smaller school environment down to the deep South culture things are just very different on a very broad scale. And so I spent a couple years there um, getting to know people and, and, and being somebody who wasn't from the area, but finding that kind of common ground through my work, which at the time was with the YMCA. I was an aquatic director and my first real jump into the park and rec profession. And so you started to see that no matter where you were from, there was this common thread that kind of pulled us all together and 
made us something that was similar that we could start from and then grow relationships from there. And about 10 years ago, I moved to Milwaukee. I was looking to get back to the Midwest and I hadn't quite, you know, ever lived in a city the size because even Baton Rouge is a little bit smaller than Milwaukee is itself. And obviously, you know, Milwaukee is faced with its challenges also. And so coming here, something bigger, a bigger city than I'd ever lived in with a unique set of challenges, but also a unique set of opportunities with the environment and the park system and my profession specifically to build bridges and build relationships. I really thought it was great to take that, you know, having moved multiple times in my life up to this point, and no matter where I was, always finding that common thread and a reason to, you know, say hello to somebody because we're enjoying the same thing in the same environment and looking at each other from across the way. It was a way to step into that and start building the groundwork with it. And so from there, that's re really sprung through my professional career, through my personal relationships, through my network, um, you know, reaching out into being a part of FU Milwaukee through the past couple of years and going to those events also. Is always just finding that one thing that I can say, hey, we have this, so it's important for me to see what else we have and I can learn from you and we can start to build a friendship. Perfect. Okay, Darren, we'll go to you. How about you? Well, I was raised a nerd. Um, I went to science camp in eighth grade, uh, so that made me actually certified nerd. And um, it was interesting because I went to Morris Middle School and um, it was pretty much a 50-50 black-white um, school. I mean, but in the classes I was in, it was mostly all white kids. Like there was only one other black kid in my, in my track. So it was like three different tracks in my, and he actually left in the middle of my eighth grade year so they didn't even have him. And so then I went to Madison High School and I started finding that my friend circle was black, but in my classes, it was all white. And it really got to a point where um, I was like, well, if smart meant being white, well, I'm not white, so I don't want to be smart. I just want to just be a regular kid. And so when I ended up going to the military, I, again, it started running into this whole idea of, well, you know, as a, as a black person doing well, I mean, I got stripes early, started advancing, but I got no support, really got an experience in a lot of, um, of anti-black people succeeding. And I knew there just had to be a better way. And so I started doing more, you know, finding out about who I was as a black person. I mean, I've always had diverse friends. Like my friends have been, um, I've had white nerd friends. I've got um, Indian nerd friends. Like it just is really this group of playing Dungeons and Dragons and just, yeah, for real, like <laughs> real nerd skills. But the, but the thing was, like it had, this had to be better. So once I understood really who I was and started learning about black culture and um, scientists, then I started saying, okay, we can do things in a better way. And so um, I started being an advocate. So we were, we uh, wrote a, I went to Marquette University, wrote some paper, uh, some, um, some things in the paper about how the black student union used to be in a separate building on the fourth floor away from everybody. Then eventually they ended up moving it into the bottom on the first floor. They moved out into the northwest side of Milwaukee and again surrounded by black people. Then as you started moving up and further up, my friend circle just started getting further and further, uh, you know, white, black, everything. But what I found was there, I'm the connector, but they would never connect outside of me. And so the reason I'm a part of this is, is because I think there's a, a thousand fold. Well, number one is this, that... Um, there truly is value in, especially as you travel the world in different cultures and seeing things from a different perspective. Um, you don't have to know everything. Uh, I believe the more intelligent you are, the more you know you don't know everything. And I found that by having people that have, that are, that are immigrants, they have a different perspective. Um, people that are, have lived in the suburbs or in rural areas have a different perspective. And then I married my wife who's white and he has a cottage um, we made s'mores and never made a s'more. I'd heard of a s'more before. Um, I believe s'mores existed, but I never actually experienced a s'more. And so, um, and now we have a fire pit in our backyard and we make them. And I think that the coming together of the cultures, we really can do the best of the worlds to make the world better. And so I think that's what is connecting me to this. And that's why I do the work that I do. 
Thank you so much. We used to, uh, to joke that all of, for vacations, all my white friends went up north and all my black friends go down south. So. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Every time it's like, oh, we're going up north. And I'm like, I ain't never been up north. <laughs> <laughs> so you just described my, this is me and my wife. Like my wife, we, her family, we go to up north to the cottage, which we're doing on next Wednesday. And with my family, we tend to go down south down to go south. visit my family. That's sort of, but that's what we do now. So yeah. <laughs> mix it all in. Mix it all in. How about you, Tanya? So um, I grew up in New York City. I actually grew up on the borough of Staten Island. And so, and, and I'm Jewish. Um, and um, one would think that in New York City, which has um, the largest population of Jews outside of Israel, um, one would think that, you know, I would feel in my comfort zone. And that was absolutely not the case growing up. Um, we were um, the only um, Jewish people uh, in my neighborhood. Um, in a, it was a predominantly white neighborhood um, of a certain ethnic group, and um, I definitely felt it. I was, um, our family was absolutely marginalized um, in the community um, because we, um, we are um, uh, a more observant family and we practice um, um, doing certain religious and cultural activities. So it was definitely noticeable in our neighborhood. And because of that, there was a lot of bias towards our, our family, which is, I'm sure it's surprising for people to hear that because, you know, I, when you say New York City, you automatically think, you know, of, you know, Jewish people as being comprised um, of, um, of the city because it is, it's, it's a thir it's 13% of the New York City population. So, um, um, and because of that, I felt more comfortable growing up within the Jewish community because I felt like people understood me better. I didn't have to explain why I kept kosher, why we kept the Jewish Sabbath, why we kept certain Jewish holidays. Um, and also I'm a child of um, two immigrants. So my mother is Israeli and my father is a Holocaust survivor. So the marginalization of uh, our family was even more poignant because of my father's experience as, as a Holocaust survivor. Um, I grew up going to um, Jewish, ele uh, Jewish elementary, middle school and high school. And my, believe it or not, my first exposure to di like a diverse group of people was my, were my first two years of college when I went to Israel. Um, I went to Bar Ilan University in Ramat Gan, Israel. And um, there were people from all walks of life um, on campus. Um, and the other thing, the other myth that people, um, that I wanted to dispel is that Jewish people are not only white. Um, there are black Jews, there are um, Jews of Asian descent, um, Jews of just of different walks of life. And it was just so, it, it was so eye-opening, my, especially my first year on campus, um, to see all these different types of Jews who, you know, we have the commonality of our religion and our, and our heritage, but even within our religion and heritage, there are nuances. So it was really quite beautiful um, to experience that. And um, I felt because of how I grew up, um, I felt it was important to understand other, where other people come from and um, be more sensitive to it because I want people to be more sensitive to um, the Jewish experience and what it's like to, to be a Jew. Um, and so I, even though I, I don't um, purposely seek out friends or colleagues of people of color or of different backgrounds, I just somehow I naturally migrate. Um, I think it's a function because I want to know what people are all about. I want to hear people's opinions. I may not agree with everything, but I want to understand it because it makes me a better person and it makes me more sensitive and more intelligent, both emotionally and intellectually. And it opens your eyes to such a an amazing world of uh, of different um, thoughts and and um, and experiences. So I think it's just so great that you know you Corey Joe are leading this and Fuel is taking such um, a leadership role um, in such a um, um, a productive way. Um, and I'm again I'm like floored that you called me earlier today to be part of this. 
Of course. I mean, you have so much to to offer and you bring a, a different uh, perspective as a white person and a Jewish person. I mean, so you can see a lot of different angles. Sherry, I want to ask you a question and just kind of leading up to it. I think part of the reason why it's so important for me to have these kinds of discussions a little bit more personal and one-on-one -on -one is because a lot of the work of Fuel is about making friends, really, for lack of a better um, word. Uh, and a lot of the conversations that I've been in when HR is in the room around diversity, it's about like the business case for diversity and, you know, it's better for business and it's better for the bottom line. And we, and I feel like in some ways the business community has defaulted to that bottom line kind of narrative and shy away a little bit from the, the I don't know if it's, it's mushy or if it's too sentimental or whatever <laughs> about the personal connections, which to me are the most important um, piece when you talk about eradicating racism and really having a society that's, that's you know, truly um, about equality. You work in the world of DNI. How have you balanced between the business need to have diversity and really changing culture um, through connections and people? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I've been on both sides of it, right? When I worked in, you know, the manufacturing world, it was very much bottom line. You had to build that business case and sell it to your leadership that this is important for us to be successful. Um, I work in healthcare now, which is in a nonprofit space, um, but it's still important that I think a lot of organizations are now understanding that it's more than just the bottom line. It's, it's the people that make that bottom line work. And it's, you really have to focus on the people in order for that to really be successful. And I think, you know, Tanya, you were, you were, you know, alluding to all of those reasons why um, having a diverse circle is so important because, you know, those connections that you make help you actually be a better leader. It, they help you be a better colleague, help you be a better person in general, right? Because you're able to be open to different ideas, be able to problem solve in different ways, including more people in the conversation helps you get a better holistic view that maybe you don't have just in your own experience. Um, so, what we have now at Freighter, which we're really proud of, is that we focus everything around this concept of dignity and respect, right? How do you treat people? Everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, you know, regardless of who they are, where they come from, whether they're a staff member, a patient, a visitor, a vendor, anyone who comes through our doors deserves that at a minimum, right? So helping our staff members see the impact that they have on somebody's experience from the moment they walk through the door is a huge you know, selling point for us. We try to make sure that people know they have all this power to change somebody's experience just by smiling at them or saying hello or making eye contact. And that's just even like the smallest amount of connection that you can make with a person. Um, when you're working together day to day, you have even more influence over that. So how do you show up as a leader, as a colleague, as a, you know, as a team member um, and bringing that value of dignity and respect to the table every day? Um, so I think when we talk about how important it is for people to connect with one another, it's for all those reasons, because it helps you, you know, it, it creates that social currency, right, that you can walk through the organization with and be able to help one another and trust one another and build those relationships even more that help you in so many other aspects of your life, not just on the job, but even personally as well. So that, that's been a, a great refreshing change of pace, I think, um, that I've seen a lot of organizations move towards. Julie, I'm wondering too, in your role, it seems like you would have a balance of the business case and the actual, you know, the strategy being more about serving the community and actual connections with people. How have you kind of balanced those two in your world? Yeah, so um, American Family Insurance, I, I think most of you must have seen that we bought the building on Mendel Drive, right, on, on MLK. Um, and I think part of why we're doing what we're doing is that, um, there was a wrong that occurred in the past that a lot of companies in this country need to make right, right? So that comes in the form of investment in communities that have been marginalized due to systemic racism and institutional racism that have led us to be in the situation that we're in today. So I think part of, of what we're doing is a recognition of the exclusionary practices that um, our economy has, um, have, we are in this situation because of that. So, and when you do that, you're, you are missing out on so much talent and people and, and livelihood and community and vibrancy of place, right? So we've invested really heavily in, um, I think if, uh, you guys must have seen this morning, Jack Constellations, Nadia, 
Johnson is leading a pretty big effort to diversify the tech startup space. And there's so when you you there's so many ideas in our community that have been left out because people don't know one another, right? So again, when you're when you live in the dominant group and you only interact with people in that dominant group circle, there are lots of ideas and lots of businesses and lots of you know entrepreneurs that you don't interact with. And so um, the business case for diversity should just be that you there are people who, who have ideas that you haven't even captured, right? So, um, and, and communities that you're responsible for like wealth generation and, and making sure that they're brought to the table. So um, in, our, in my role, it's really investing in people to, to lead at the front and make sure that their voices and their ideas are represented and well-funded because that's always really important too. So a lot of times we don't talk about that, that piece and then making sure that not only once they're brought to the table, are they comfortable staying at the table? Because there's so many pieces to being, feeling like you can say something, feeling like people understand you. So I think that's something that we need to continually work on as well. Yeah, so I, I think for me, we talked a little bit before we hopped on um, the broadcast, this, so I told you guys I was gonna tell you this story. So in my work, I, I mean, I socialize for a living. So we throw, you know, social events and, luncheons and after hours and, and you know so it's become a part of my practice to just have a really diverse um network but as a uh, milwaukeean you know a lot of my friends are people i went to morris middle school with or <laughs> or you know people that i met in college but as an adult especially once i started having kids i had really taken the time to really seriously incorporate more friends and when i think of friends i think of like folks that it, that can just stop by your house come in for a glass of wine or just a chit chat or that you might text, you know, in the middle of the night, did you see this show? Like friends like that. So, you know, and I'm just going through life and not really realizing that um, there's an issue until I live on 20th and Walnut. So I'm kind of in a, I'm in a very predominantly black neighborhood. My kids went to a predominantly black school and I had uh, called to get my carpet cleaned. And to the two people that came to clean the carpet, there was a white guy and a black guy. And so they come in the door and they're like getting everything ready. And my son at the time was four. So what's important about this is that he did not go to daycare. So a lot of his interactions were just whatever was gonna happen in our house, that's what he knew. <laughs> so when the technicians came in, and I'll quickly tell the story because I know you guys got good stories too. But when the technicians came in, he was like fascinated and like following them around. And I was thinking it was because of the cleaning equipment and it maybe it partially was. And they're in the room and I saw him peek around the corner, he's looking and he said under his breath, hey, white boy. And I'm like, did he just say, hey, white boy? And, and I kind of thought I heard it and I kind of thought I didn't. And I was like, he was four. So I'm like, there's no way he just said that. So then nobody acknowledged it. So he said it louder. He said. Hey, white boy. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God. I said, Ian, you can't, you can't say that. And he said, well, his face is white. So the white guy that was there was like so embarrassed. And then the black guy that was there with him is dying laughing. He's cracking up. So he tells me, well, we usually go to Brookfield and this kind of thing happens to me. And now this is the first time that it's happened to him because we're in this black neighborhood and he thinks it's hilarious and the white dude is just really embarrassed so I told my son why don't you just ask him his name so he asked him his name and then they carried on the conversation and he kept when he left he said you know said his said it by name but it really occurred to me like it's weird to my kids that there was a white person in my house and I had to start thinking like when is the last time I had a white person in my house and I really it, I, it really called me on the carpet and I'm like oh my god so the reason why that I think is so interesting is so when I started preparing for this, and I'm going to share my screen to show, share some of the stats that I found. There's all kinds of studies about this, right? So uh, diversity in friend groups, there's 40% of white Americans that don't have any non-white friends, according to this Reuters poll. And 25% of non-white Americans have no friends outside of, um, outside of their racial demographic. Then I started thinking about where are the first places that we really make friends, right? And so it's, it's school pretty much is where we start to learn how to make friends and uh, practice that behavior. And uh, in schools, 40% of Black and Latino students um, go to schools that are 90% Black and Latino. So the majority of the people that they have access to are 
people of color or their own background. The same thing for white students. My, most white students go to schools that are at least 77% white. So it just creates this, um, I think this behavior, I remember our lunch tables, it would be like the, the black lunch table and the white lunch table. And then it might be one for, you know, the nerds or whatever, but it, it was very clearly racially divided. So Darren, I know you were at the nerd table, <laughs> <laughs> but did you experience this like sort of segregation in, um, in friendships all the way through your life? I mean, I, when we we're kids, obviously, but as an adult, how did you break that? How have you experienced that? Well, like in high school, it was, I was at the black table with the black kids. In class though, I was the only black person in all my classes. And so that was the sort of disconnect. And then when I went into the Air Force, it was sort of the same thing. And it really didn't, um, it really didn't start changing until I became, um, I was a teacher still, you know, in my first, you know, first time out, it was in the business community that I started. There weren't a lot of black business owners that I knew, but I knew a bunch of, of white business owners. And so we started connecting, especially, you know, the te technology field at the time. So that was really what broke the mold. And then as I started, I, um, we ended up buying a condo um, on Humboldt and Locust. And that is like a super duper diverse part of the city. It's River West. And I started just connecting with neighbors that were different and um, just, you know, exposed my kids to this stuff. And then when I moved out to Bayside, actually that's when I got the most diverse like group of people I lived around, the people I worked with, just everything started being more diverse. But it was interesting. Um, one of the comments in this in the section says, "You guys are all outgoing people. It's easy for you to be um, to connect with people. It actually isn't. Like I, I'm just very intentional about doing it. I'm intentional about trying things. And I'll, I'll tell you a good story. My my wife, um, she's white and. Um, when I met her, so when I met her, we grew up with two types of cheese in our house, American cheese and Parmesan in the can. First of all, my wife says American cheese isn't really cheese, which who knew? And the second thing is that Parmesan cheese in the can isn't even cheese. Like she has three different types of cheese. We have the cheese block, which I didn't know it came in a block. There's a, a shredder, so the shredded, um, and then we have the can. And she has like a whole drawer dedicated just to cheese. She had cheese curds and I've never seen them in the wild before. Like I, I've seen cheese curds fried like at State Fair, but I'd never known this much cheese. And so that, that diversity of just, just people growing up differently in the same Wisconsin, it, it, I, I work really hard to say that what I've done isn't necessarily the best there could be someone doing something better. Um, my favorite food is actually not soul food or black food. It's actually Mexican food because it just, I love beans and you know tacos and rice. And so I think that intentional exposure to different things to try and learn better, I think that's the thing. And, and um, if we stay inside our comfort zone, we don't really grow. And, and being stagnant is the most fearful thing for me. I don't ever want to be like that. So therefore, I'm always putting myself in difficult situations because I don't want to be stagnant. So you're muted, yeah, yeah, yeah. Corjo. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> still getting used to it after all these months. <laughs> so like in, in, our, in our city, we do have a challenge in like geography. Um, I think I even have um, a slide I can share about like the lack of diversity in our, um, in our workplaces. So, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a, a challenge, but I'm just wondering, so here, yeah, I wanted to show this. So the percentages of um, people of, of color, particularly Hispanic, Latino and African-American, this is data that comes from uh, the MMAC's region of choice um, initiative around um, increasing the numbers of um, employees and managers in workplaces in Milwaukee. So we just I pulled a little bit of this data here and you can just look at the percentages and see how it might be challenging for um, people to really reach out and even in their workplaces and find diverse networks. But the one thing I think is really interesting is about, about Milwaukee is the festival culture that we have here and the positive piece of segregation is that you have like these really rich cultural areas that you can tap into. 
I'll open this up to anybody, but I kind of want to ask Tanya and uh, Anthony to kind of get you in here. Do you feel comfortable? Like I'm often only the black per the only black person in the room. Do you feel comfortable going to festivals or spaces or neighborhoods that aren't predominantly going to be populated with people who look like you? You were asking if I feel comfortable going into a neighborhood that has um, a festival that of people that look like me or that, that don't I look like you. Like if I said, hey, like come to the Black Arts Festival with me or, um, you know, come to Rise and Grind uh, Breakfast on, on King Drive with me. I worked with people that would be a little nervous to do that. <laughs> but I feel like it's the only way that you can really expose yourself to other people is to actually go into their spaces. Do you have a comfort level with that or is it something that you struggle with? I don't like going any place by myself. I always like to be with friends. So as long as I'm going with somebody else, like as, you know, to keep me company and to, uh, then I am totally all about it. Um, the problem that I, or the challenge that I have is most of these um, festivals revolve around food and I can't experience that because I keep kosher. Yes, okay. um, so I'm just like looking and oogling and like <laughs> my mouth is salivating most of the time. Um, so I, I, feast on my eyes and my, and my, um, my, my sense of um, smell um, when I go to these um, types of festivals. But there's a lot in these festivals in the way of music and art and how people dress. So um, that part to me is extremely fascinating. Um, and I love to go to those, you know, to see those types of festivals because it really, it's another, um, it's another slice of life. Um, it gives you a completely different perspective on who, well, at least for me, who I am as a person. Um, and it exposes me, um, you know, to um, different people's worlds. And I guess now that we're in this Corona era, um, we're all going to be kind of moaning, uh, bemoaning, not being able to do that um, because we're all, uh, you know, kind of um, relegated to social distancing. So it'll be interesting to see how organizers can mimic something like that um, in our virtual world. But I think there's, uh, I think there'll be a lot missing because of the fact that there's, you know, the food is such a, is so central to, um, it, it's central to those festivals. But, you know, we were talking about this as we were going into this live feed. Food is such a bridge builder um, that, um, it's just such a wonderful way of connecting people and uh, getting people to understand other people's culture, religion, ethnicity. And, um, and again, it's another way of, um, uh, it, you know, expanding your mind, expanding your horizons, making yourself more intelligent and, and, and just more um, exposed to like all the great things that are happening around us. Yep. I'm gonna, so I'm going to ask folks in the chat, too, if you have ideas of how people can be more intentional about diversifying their networks. I see people in there talking about yoga and other things that they do. Please leave a, a comment in the chat. Anthony, how are you deliberately um, making sure that you expose yourself to all kinds of people in Milwaukee? You know, I think that that's a great question. And one of the things I used to work for the Milwaukee Rec Department a number of years ago. And one of the things I really enjoyed about it was that my service area was basically MLK and Burleigh all the way up to 91st and Brown Deer. And so I had community centers, uh, Morse Marshall was one that I would go by often. So I <laughs> had some programs there, um, you know, all the way out into like the Blue Mound area in Tosa as well. But at community centers, I had playgrounds, I had a number of different programs all around the Northwest side of the city. And so it was great for me to really travel that area and, you know, go around and, and be exposed to the shops, the restaurants, the businesses, the parks, the facilities, um, everybody that was there. And, and I really enjoyed having that opportunity to be mobile in my work and step outside of, you know, my, so to speak, like comfort zone. Um, funny enough, at the time, I was actually living in Bayside. Um, I was living with uh, my girlfriend at the time up there. But so it was interesting because, you know, then we come down into the city and, and, and have that. And so never, never did I ever really feel um, uncomfortable in that, in that situation. There were times where it was comforting to me to have somebody who maybe knew their way around um, that I could, I could drive with, that could kind of show me some things as well too. But it was always, you know, it was always a great experience to be able to do that. And it always goes back to 
you know, my kind of lens that I view all of this through, through parks and recreation, where everybody that I was coming into contact with was at a community center, was at a playground. There are young adults in their first job in the industry, much like I had been when I was there. There are people taking their children for swim lessons, going for fitness classes, trying to learn a new skill and be social and make new friends. And I know somebody had mentioned in the chat earlier too, and Darren, you had talked about this, about the challenge of meeting new people. And I would always encourage anybody to find something that you enjoy and then seek out others who enjoy that and use that as a stepping stone to build those relationships. And when I first started in Milwaukee, I, um, I used to go to, it was called a meetup. I don't know if the website's still around or not, but there was actually a new to Milwaukee meetup that I would go to. And that's how I got involved with fuel as well. At the time I felt like I was working for the city. You know, there's, there's so many individuals in Milwaukee and businesses and professionals and opportunity to meet people and, and, network and engage outside of that. And so I really enjoyed going to those leadership luncheons. And I really enjoyed going to those, I think, Tuesday or Thursday night networking events that they were. And I do miss that. And that's something that I don't, I don't currently work for the city now. And so it's a part of me that it's a part of me that I don't get as much. And I apologize, Corey, I really need to come back to some of those events because I do miss it. But my, my network has, has expanded then um, beyond that to when you look at the statewide level of Wisconsin and parks and recreation and you see the differences between the more rural communities and the urban communities and then when you jump beyond that too, the opportunity to connect with other professionals who are putting themselves out there have the same passions want to make the same difference and have the same impact and you know it's somebody in Baltimore it's somebody in Florida it's somebody in Texas it's somebody in California and somebody that's in a very large you know major urban area, you know, New York City, something along those lines, and then somebody who they are a one person department in Alaska. Um, and so I think that, you know, the local level, there's that intentionality of just trying to, you know, get out and expand my network and, and realize like, you know, why do you love Milwaukee? Well, here's what I love it. I love it. How can we, you know, share in that? And how can you tell me about your experience so I can understand and, you know, and we'll share those things back and forth as well, too. So it's always, it's always been an, an, something intentional to me and something I've enjoyed just, you know, getting outside of my bubble or outside of my sphere and just learning about other people and their journey and what brought them here. And then when they do face adversity, when they do face challenges, I understand how I can be, you know, an ally to them, how I can be a friend, how I can stand up for them and stand with them. And beside them because I, I have that experience of knowing them and so when they come and talk to me then I say okay so let me work with you let me talk to you how can we we go through this together how can I support you and I think that that's a key with a lot of the challenges that are happening today is that if people don't get to know others and if people just you know have their lens and their view and they are not intentional about the way others view the world and experience it when problems arise and challenges arise that need addressing, they don't feel a connection to it because it's somebody else, it's something else. And so, you know, this is where it all goes back to, we talked about food, but for me, it's parks. Like we could all spend some more time in parks, smiling at each other and being polite and realizing why we're there and whatnot. And it sounds very, you know, like, oh, it's so great, you, you know, utopia or whatever. But the reality is it is a common core element that I've yet to find somebody in my life that doesn't enjoy that element in their neighborhood of green space so it's kind of a long-winded answer but i hope that i answered it well <laughs> yeah that's actually a great um you started to tr transition into the conversation that i want to have around what we're seeing in the world today i feel like uh the world watched george uh floyd lose lose his life in this really you know inhumane and unjust way and i think, you know, I wonder sometimes if we weren't in quarantine, if this would, if this awakening would have happened, but because everybody was at home to see it, it's like we all experienced it together, and it was the, the humanness of that loss and the injustice, and I just feel like it's just brought us all together, um, or those who are going to be brought together by it in a really important way. So, I'm thinking about our friendships and the connections and, and all of you have special friendships and connections. Do you have friends or people that have helped you see 
the world in a different way that you, that you feel like have pushed you to be a little bit more um, open-minded or, um, I mean, I'm, I certainly have that in my, my experiences with the women that I've worked with um, at Fuel. I'm close to all of them and they're all white. And I'm, I mean, the ones that have come, come and gone and we're still tight, you know, and I learned about sunburn and the blisters that people get, you know, like, like, okay, let's not go to lunch. Let's not walk at noon because, you know, it's going to burn Kara's skin. <laughs> and I remember the first time seeing her burn, I'm like, what's wrong with your skin? She's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's because we walked to, you know, Mikey's and it was at noon and you sunburn. I was like, sunburn? <laughs> I mean, I just had no, I just had no idea about certain things. And we laugh and talk and they're like completely open to the questions that I have. What experiences have you had that have, um, help you see what other people's lives um, are like. I feel like I'm a little bit more um, open-minded because of my diverse network. How about you guys? Anybody can answer that one. So Corey, can I go pull both of the question you asked before and this one together? First yeah. of all, SPF is very important and regardless or not, if you're white or a person of color, you should <laughs> be wearing it. I'm a big proponent of SPF 50 plus. That's what's important. Um, secondly, I think, um, with what's happening in the world, um, and if you want to really be in an intentional space, there are marches happening every single day, every day for justice, to be in a place with people, to be in a community with people, not in a harmful way, but in a way that you really truly understand the pain and what's going on. And you're hearing from different speakers in the community, you're walking through different communities, so I really urge those who feel comfortable, you know, if you're really looking to diver diversify where you are, what you're listening to, who you're listening to, take an opportunity. There's so many, there's so many ways to plug in right now. And I know it's like a really scary environment, but second, you know, there are places in our community that you can go to. There's the Sherman Phoenix. They've got all sorts of food there. Um, Fong Savon Asian market, you know, go get your groceries from somewhere that's not Metro market or pick and save. You know, there's there's two Indian markets. There's Bharat Mart on Farwell. There's a big one by Mayfair. So, you know, I think like interacting with people and getting a sense of, of being in a community that's different than yours, but doing it not harmfully, right? Not othering the person or making them exotic and using them as a means to an end because you don't know about their life. Stay away from that, but do it intentionally. You know, you know go out of your way to buy your whatever curry paste from a market that actually has maybe authentic curry paste instead of whatever comes in the bag, you know? Um, so I think there are ways to do it. I think that we just, we, we have to think really intentionally right now about, about diversifying our friendships because there are so many people who are in a lot of pain. And so asking those communities or people who are in pain to now do an extra level of hey, can you diversify my life and explain to me all these things? I just, I, I just think we have to like think about it a little bit and, and approach it in ways that, that are not harmful to others and not exotifying or othering them further. And I think that there are ways even in a COVID era. I feel like I've seen so many Zoom meetings, the African American Roundtable, leaders uh, at LIT, um, Block, MKE, all these groups are putting on really educational you know, Zooms that talk about the state of affairs in the world that have participants that come from all various walks of life that you can really start to interact to because I don't think that you can be friends with a diverse group of people without understanding the pain points that come with being a diverse person in this country at this point in time. You j those two things to me are inseparable. So if you don't see me and you don't hear me and you don't understand me, then I don't know that you can really participate with it in the in the playground that I play in in the way that you'd want to. Mm -hmm. I, I will oh, go, go ahead, ahead, Darren. I was gonna say uh, real quickly. That's interesting. I believe that you try. You're gonna make mistakes. It's like being uh, if you want to have a diverse uh, group of friends or even get in diverse circles. I think you're not gonna understand. I think you're gonna offend. I think you're going to hurt. I think that's sort of part of it. Like if you listen to Corey Joseph, they're laughing about her, um, about her friend being sunburned. Some people will be offended by that. My thing is just, you have to be in it for the long haul. If you're in this for a short term, then you're right. You're going to have to like, be careful what you say, be careful how you do it. But if you make a commitment to doing this long term, 
then you got to try some things out. You're going to ask, well, why is your skin so dark? Or, you know, why do you have all those spots on you? Or you're going to ask things like that because you're curious and like, like kids do. But if you're in it, if people know you really care and that you're, 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 you're trying to really connect, then I, I believe you just have to just try. And, and so um, I, I believe what you're saying, Jilly, is 100% correct. I just think you also, you can use it as an excuse to not do stuff because you're, you don't want to step on toes or like, I've got a bunch of white friends of mine and family members saying, well, Darren, I don't want to say the wrong thing to my black friends. I said, well, just talk to them. And if you say the wrong thing, say, hey, I didn't mean to say that. If you tell me a different way, but just keep going, be persistent because this is only going to be, this is 400 years of an infused uh, mindset that is not going to be fixed in 40 minutes. It's going to take time. So that was my only piece. I support what you're saying, just a nuance to it. The only thing I, I want to, what I want to say is, I, let me let me talk about, for instance, Corey Joe. Um, I met Corey Joe many many years ago. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for Corey Joe. I'm friends with Corey Joe not because she's an African American woman, but because she's an intelligent, creative, and thoughtful and sensitive person. And so I think. I, I, for me, it's not going out intentionally making black friends or people, uh, friends of, of, of different color. It's about um, being friends with people because I like who they are. I like what they represent. I, I like who they are as people. It just so happens that, you know, whoever I am, whoever I'm friends with that are people of different color happen to be people of different color. It's not something that I'm seeking out. Um, it, it's something that it naturally happens in my, like in my Tanya world. Yeah, I think people have that natural tendency to find what's familiar to them, but usually familiar is based on a visual thing first. And we have to get to that level of feeling familiar versus looking familiar. Right. Um, so, you know, people have similarities in all different levels and it's not always just the surface, which is the first instinct we tend to have. Um, when we talk about, I think going back to Jilly's comments about where we can find places to interact. I mean, if you are finding causes that are important to you, there's always people <laughs> that also want to share and you have that point of commonality already, you know, that that doesn't matter what, what you look like on the surface. You have a common cause that you're passionate about that, you know, people will gravitate towards and you can have a different kind of conversation about things, right? So you can build those relationships that way. And the intentionality is so important because diversity is not going to come to your doorstep. You know, if you live out in the verbs like like I do now, you have to go to where, you know, those experiences are. Or else if you don't have those opportunities near you, create the space for it. You know, we have a, a great circle of friends who intentionally host, you know, dinner parties where it's a very diverse group of people and they invite new people to come because it provides a new opportunity for somebody new to experience that too. So the power of invitation is really big. Um, so if you can bring somebody along and invite them to an opportunity or an event where they can be surrounded by diversity. Um, I mean, that's a great uh, way to help spread, you know, that experience to others that may not have that, that, um, that chance to do it or creating that space on your own, I think is really powerful. Um, and as some people had said, you know, sometimes they don't feel comfortable going somewhere by themselves, you know, invite somebody along with you or, you know, take somebody or say, hey, I'll be your, you know, your cultural ambassador for this particular journey that you're on and, and be willing to do that. Sometimes it's what it takes um, to be able to help, you know, create that space for growth and learning. Like Darren said, you know, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable because that's where growth happens. Yeah, I think it's the, um, the webinar that we had on Tuesday one of the speakers talked about our um, mental models and the way that we are used to going through the world and how we tend to repeat that the same behaviors that we've adopted. And I just, I just feel like a lot of times because we segregate in our minds, our friends from our colleagues or, you know, how we meet people and how we make friends and what family looks like and what close friendships look like, even though, you know, to Tanya's point, you can really connect with a person and really, really like them, but it might never occur to you to invite them over to dinner. Now that's an, that's another layer to that, and I'll say that too, because most of the folks here are in Milwaukee and you know from Milwaukee. Milwaukeeans, uh, then more than other cities that tend to be a little bit more transient, we're a little bit more clicky. Is probably not the right word, but it's the word that I that I know how to use around this 
this concept that I'm that's trying the to right word. I think you used the right word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the right word. Corey. I don't think, you know, we're all nice, but I mean, I've had people say that in Fuel, like, you know, everybody's nice. When I come to the Fuel event, everybody's nice. Everybody's <laughs> pretty polite, friendly. They, you know, they'll buy me a drink. But on Saturday, you know, I, don't, I can't go to anybody's house and raid their refrigerator. And that's what the real connection, you know, that's when it happens. People really want to be able to make connections with you and i've had people walk up to me more than once and say i want to be your friend or so you're, <laughs> and i might or so you're you. invited to my house anytime to raid yeah. my refrigerator yeah let's 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 do it i mean i think if we gotta be share that address please like, <laughs> i think we're all saying there's times when we just want to get something different and so Come i just need to know where you live so i am in come on over you all are watching it it's as it's as easy as it's it's as easy as that. And I'm, I have an extra, I'm outgoing, but there's a very introverted side to me. I know all of us, all of the personalities are different. Um, social media, I mean, LinkedIn and, and there's all kind of reports and, and studies and research that says that people, the more that they use their social media platforms, the more diverse their networks tend to be. There's nobody that I reach out to and ask a question and they're like, don't, don't reach out to me, don't ask me a question. You know, I think a lot of times networking and making connections um, is not as scary, um, not as scary as we, as we think. So we encourage all of you to do that. So as we wrap up, I'm gonna have each of you go around and give it your last thoughts. I mean, we got uh, about, let's see, 80, 80 or so people here listening to you. Sherry, do you have any last thoughts, last encouragement, last words for folks who are looking to, diversify their networks. Wow, I think, you know, doing things like just being a part of these panels or listening, listening is a huge piece of it, right? Just being open to hearing different stories, being open to experiencing something new um, is really that first step. And then, you know, it takes some courage too to, to be able to say, hey, I wanna be your friend <laughs> or hey, you know, let's, let's do something together, you know, outside of work. A lot of people are only really getting exposure to diversity, sometimes the workplace is the only place that they have access uh, to people who look different from them. So it, it's going to take some work. It, it takes work to find and seek out and experience things. But again, as somebody also said in the panel, you don't have to do it all at once. You can start by reading. You can start by watching. You can start by following certain personalities on Twitter or on social media platforms to so get to hear and see, get used to seeing different voices and different perspectives. And that just really gives you a little bit more background and a little bit more um, learning to, to, to grow from. How about you, Jilly? Um, yeah, I just think like putting yourself, I know it's like a weird time to be alive in terms of COVID, but um, I think just like putting yourself in places that you normally wouldn't go. Again, so going out of your way to get a grocery from somewhere you wouldn't tap or spending time at no studios or maybe getting a membership, I don't know, to the Black Lens, you know, uh, film thing that MKE Film does. Just mm -hmm. where do you, where do you, where do you default to? And then think about go research to other places that you could maybe substitute to the places you default to because that's when you're going to start kind of bumping into people that you you wouldn't bump into. So I think just like thinking strategically about where you're spending your time and what, where you're spending your money, right? So, yeah. How about you, Darren? Mine's just be in it for the long haul. Um, this, if, if, the, if the leaders are comfortable with the way things are, the leaders aren't the ones who suffer. It's the people who don't have access and are fortunate. So to me, the people here on the, we're all leaders, the people on this, this, um, this feed, your leaders, it's on us to make that difference. So um, be uncomfortable, be intentional, but be in it for the long haul. And then we, we eventually are all done doing this. Whatever we're doing, we can all rest our heads knowing that we, we uh, fulfilled our, our purpose and that is to make the world a better place. And so that's my piece. Tanya, how about you? So I, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat. Um, I wanna tell some of the people that have um, saying that they're, it's very hard to just put yourself out there and say, I wanna be your friend. I was, painfully shy as a kid. Um, I know that my brother and my sister-in-law are watching through a face through a Facebook party right now this, um, this panel discussion. So my brother can attest to the fact that I was really, really shy as a kid. And so 
I intentionally, or I have as a, as a young adult and into my mid-adulthood, I'm intentionally putting myself out there um, to meet new people um, and get a different perspective on life because, again, it makes me a better person and a better leader. Um, I recently, or in the last two years, I um, took up um, uh, marathon training and marathon running and through social media, I've met so many different people from all, all over the world, frankly. Um, and it's also, it's just broadened my horizon. So it's, I think it's about conscious use of self um, and, it cre and it makes you a better person and um, it, it, it gives you a different perspective on the world. And I think even in a COVID environment, I think even more so in a COVID environment, you can, you can do this because we have so much access um, to um, different platforms where we can meet new people or get a different perspective on, on, on different people, different um, viewpoints, different people's politics, uh, people's religion. So I think it's just all about um, your interest in wanting to learn about other people. And again, it's all about conscious use of self and it creates, makes you a more sensitive and an intelligent person. And Anthony, how about you? Well, anybody that's watching this, they'll hear me talk about networking. I always say the same thing and that's your network is your net worth. And what I mean by that is, you know, ask yourself what you want to be bountiful in. Do you want to be you know, rich in friendship, rich in love, rich in experiences? Um, and use that as what drives you forward with reaching out to others and building relationships and getting to know people. And I always, you know, when you come across somebody that's new, if it's at a networking event or if you're putting yourself out there in an uncomfortable situation to grow, and you know, go somewhere by yourself or with somebody else. It's just typically the people you come across when you're intentional about where you put yourself are there because they have something in common with you. And so I would, at first, when you come across people, you know, find what's common and, and think about what is a way that you can connect. And even if it's the smallest thing, we just both happen to be standing at, you know, the Sherman Phoenix for the first time, or we're at this event, or we're in this new park, or wherever you are, there's, there's an opportunity there to get to know that person, to say hello. And even if it's just something that starts as an acquaintance or somebody that you bump into, and then you can build upon that, just look for those opportunities to really be in that moment. And so I think it's important that we all take the time to do that. And I know a lot of people, like others have mentioned in the comments, a lot of it comes down to, you know, the clickiness of Milwaukee or finding friends or or putting yourself out there and it is uncomfortable and it is a challenge at times. And, you know, I'm sure that all of us who have our groups of friends and people that are, we are colleagues and professionals that we know, those all just didn't start with an easy, Oh, Hey, how's it going? You know, and then, and then those relationships are deep. I mean, I know some of the people on this panel, we've known each other for, it took us a number of years to get here. And so like Darren said, be in it for the long haul to really grow deep and really get to know people and really to expand and, Give yourself time to be vulnerable and give yourself time to make mistakes, but just don't give yourself time to be stagnant and not do anything because then it'll never work out. You got to keep, keep moving. Thank you guys. I want to thank all of the panelists so much for participating in this conversation. It's been really good and we got a lot of good engagement in the chat. So in fuel webinar fashion, I'm going to play um, a cute video that I found um, about having diverse friends on uh, I found it on YouTube I love YouTube by the way um, and so in this time if you're a participant just listening and you have to hop off because you got a conference call or something go ahead and do that um, also the same for the panelists I know you guys are busy if you have something to do while we're playing that it's about five minutes long video is a chance for you to kind of go back through the chat relook at the comments and leave a little love note for the panelists. Tell them how great they were and how much you enjoyed them. And also, if you have any suggestions for me uh, for topics that you like to uh, see us cover or people that you like to see us talk to, now would be the time for you to um, put those in the chat, okay? So I'm gonna share this video, and then when it's over, we will adjourn the discussion. <laughs> hey, <laughs> can we start a video already? <gasps> All right. You ready? <laughs> <laughs>
welcome to another episode of Mo Chris, the place to be where we tackle relationship stereotypes, racial stereotypes, and sometimes we talk about the space-time continuum. But in this episode, we are going to tackle how to have racially diverse friends. Yay, this is a good topic, and it's actually a viewer submission. Phaedra messaged me and asked if we could cover this. This is what Phaedra said. Hey there, I love your Mo Chris videos. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. So I finally moved from a very homogenous area, and one of the things I really want are culturally and racially diverse friendships. I don't want to do anything embarrassing if I try to befriend someone from another race. I would love a video with your guys' thoughts. Oh, interesting. This okay, is I'm actually a really, really good one. So straight up, what I want to recommend is don't overthink it. I think especially when it comes to white people and they want to say hey i want to have more diverse friends or you know anything like that they tend to come off awkward and i feel that the main reason why they do that is because they're overthinking things they're like i don't want to piss them off i don't want to do this just treat that person as if 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 needs be pretend that other person's a white person and just talk to them like any other human being any other friend that you have so don't overthink anything and i would also say just make sure to put yourself in situations where you're not the only, where you're where it's just all white people or one all one race make sure you go to networking events or i don't know outings or anything like that that have like diverse people there i've seen a lot of white people act awkward at events or where they go and they're they're the minority and mm -hmm. i think the really the way to get over that is just to continue to immerse yourself in those situations mm -hmm. and do your best to just treat it like it's a norm they're normal human beings yeah. Yeah, go figure yeah um just be yourself <laughs> be yourself and just don't, don't overthink it, like Mo was saying, just don't overthink it. And fair warning, yes, especially sometimes when you when white people are a minority, you will initially get looks because people are automatically going to judge you because they're like, they're not used to you being there in the first place. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this has happened before where I've taken Crystal to, I don't know, different events or things and she's like the only white girl there. But all she does is have that nice cheesy smile, cheese. And people, and, and the fact that she doesn't come off as awkward or she doesn't have the bitchy resting place or anything like that, like people immediately open up and she makes sure she says hi and she introduces herself. And that's how, that's a great way on, on how to break that kind of barrier or the ice right there. And be prepared to maybe get some hate a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hate to say that this will happen, but I mean, it will most likely. I've been to events, and this was before I even met Monique, where I went to an event where I was the only white girl there. And I actually got called out on it publicly by the, the person who was emceeing the event. And I got, I got mocked and made fun of. Um, and I just took it in stride and I laughed along with it and then I eventually showed them all up by having the moves on the dance floor and the, the MC actually came up to me afterwards and like gave me a hug and uh, so just you know just be prepared to maybe deal with that and just take it in stride and be yourself and be kind and be friendly and caring for people and I think you'll be good. You'll be good. Yeah. Oh, and one last tip. Whatever you do, control those facial features, okay? If you do feel uncomfortable, don't do the whole side eye and kind of like clutching to your bag or anything like that. That automatically will set people off. Oh my so, God, there's a black person. Let me grab my bag. Right. So don't, as much as you can, control your face, even if you might feel slightly uncomfortable, which you shouldn't, okay? You shouldn't. So what do you guys think about the tips that we just shared about how to have a diverse group of friends or approaching people of a different ethnicity? Please leave them in the comments down below. And be sure to like this video if you like it and subscribe to our channel so that you get to see all of the awesome videos that we put out on a weekly basis. They come out on Tuesdays and Thursdays unless we're a little bit behind schedule. Are we drinking? Are we drinking? <laughs> Or, or we drinking. So anyway, there's lots of lots of conversations like that on YouTube. And I wanted to show just how easy it is for you to have those conversations in your own life. I see we got a lot of activity in this chat. I'm going to share all of your comments with the panelists. Thanks again to the panelists for being here. Thanks for all the participants being here. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Sh Sherry, Jilly, Anthony, Darren, and Tanya. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job, Corey Joe. Dinner party right. very soon. Yes, I am in. And I would even cook. Our barbecue backyard is full. I'm in. So you oh. just, we, coordinate, we coordinate some time. That would be like my contribution. We got it. We're going to hold you to that barbecue. Done. Done. I'll, bring the wine. I'll bring the wine and the beer. Okay.
right. Thank you, guys. Thank You're you. welcome. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Have a good weekend. I see you in the chat. I'm leaving it up a little bit because I know some of you are still typing. <laughs> Angela, let me see. I'm going to get that uh, YouTube channel for you. Let me share that for you. All right, Angela. That's the link to that video, and then you can just subscribe to their channel. Thanks, everyone. I see your comments. You guys are great. Okay, be safe this weekend. See you later.